right now I'm a captain, 737 captain, and I've also been with UVA uh, for, I don't even know, long, a long time. Uh, and this is one of the best VAs, and I'm, I'm very proud to be part of it. I greatly appreciate the opportunity to, to chat with you guys and to also give back. I'm very passionate about this, so uh, don't be shy to reach out, or if we want to have these on a regular basis, uh, let us know. Give us your feedback on how we can improve this process or make it better. How about we just get right into it? Does that sound good, Orst? Yeah, that sounds good. Well, uh, so the first question uh, is from Tim. When do you select VOR LOC, that is localizer mode, versus approach mode on the MCP, when you can use both for an ILS? Does it depend on the distance from the FAF, that is, is approach mode availability limited by the distance uh, to go to the station? Yeah, so good question. And uh, there's, you know, this is probably a good time to discuss that there are differences between uh, real world 737, what we fly, and then what PMDG uh, implemented in, in their design. So real world, we did not pay for the IAC function. So when I hit approach mode, uh, as long as I have an ILS tuned up or a GLS tuned up, um, I'm just going to get localizer glide slope. And so there, if I'm outside of the service volume or outside of receiving a glide slope, if I hit approach, I'm still going to get localizer glide slope, unlike what's in PMDG, which is if, if I'm outside receiving or attuning the ILS and you hit approach, you're going to get IAC. So there's a quick clarification there. And then the difference between what I select on the MCP panel is what I'm cleared for. So if I'm cleared for the ILS, I'm going to hit the approach button because I want localizer and glide slope guidance. If I'm cleared either the localizer approach or cleared to track the localizer inbound initially, which is very common uh, for the major airports, I'll hit localizer. So those are, that's basically the, the easiest way to, to answer that question is what are you cleared for? If you're cleared for the localizer, hit the localizer. If you're cleared for the ILS, hit the approach uh, button when we're talking about the localizer versus the approach. Now, VOR, uh, VOR, that is very carrier specific. We have an op spec at, that allows us to do an RNAV approach in lieu of a VOR approach. Um, and so uh, I'm going to, uh, I'll set up a VOR approach just like an RNAV GPS. So I'll still hit in LNAV, VNAV, but I'll just have the VOR localizer called up on the uh, EFIS panel and on my NAV display because we have to display the, the VOR needles. But uh, for an approach, I very rarely, if ever, hit the VOR button. Um, the only time I hit the VOR button is if I've lost my ability to navigate via my FMC. Is that, uh, does that answer that one? Tim, do you have a follow-up or is that uh, pretty much covered? And then that, while he's typing that, does it depend on the distance from the FAF for the approach mode? Can't detect prior to a certain distance. So this is um, real world versus SIM. So real world, we try not to engage the approach outside of the service volumes for the localizer or glide slope. It's not because we're worried about it, us not tuning the ILS, we can actually, I've, I've received a good identifier a, a ways way out. Real world though, let's say I'm on a base leg or a dog leg to a base leg uh, for an ILS approach and I hit a, the approach mode far out. The approach mode could snag a, it could receive a side lobe uh, off of the radar or off of the antenna for the localizer or the glide slope. And it could falsely intercept glide slope or localizer. How do I know that? It actually happened to me in Lahui last week where they cleared us for the approach outside of uh, Nepala. And I hit the approach mode thinking that uh, there was no way I was going to get any side load interference. And literally 30 seconds later, she captured the, the uh, localizer and she started an immediate turn. Uh, so it was a great opportunity to go ahead and click off all the automation and hand fly for a little bit while we uh, get coupled back up. But you want to be cognizant of hitting the approach mode in certain areas as to not interfere uh, with any side lobe. Um, probably not an issue with SIMS, but real world that is in our supplemental section and something uh, to be concerned with. Good. So uh, a, a semi-related question, uh, this on the RNAV side. Uh, Spiros asked, with the, does the 737 
support app mode in in the in our nav how is it activated do we use the app button on the mcp or we leave it on lnav vnav or something else so i guess this is kind of addressing the ian uh, side of things yeah correct so um and it was ian sorry i know i said yeah iac that's only one component of the ian but yeah for us so this is carrier specific again for uh, us fly our rnav approaches and lnav vnav uh, on the 737. 787, approach mode with every single approach. Doesn't matter. Hit approach. Uh, we don't have that capability. We didn't buy that that capability. So for an RNAV approach, LNAV, VNAV. For an RNAV RNP required to use VNAV inside of final approach fix. For RNAV GPS, you can use vertical speed inside of final approach fix uh, if you so desire, but that is that is rare, at least where I come from. Good. Well, I think that uh, covers it. What acronyms do you use when conducting RNAV approaches? <laughs> yeah. This is, uh, yeah, this is technique. This is from Ben, I'm assuming, right? Is that, that, is that the Ben question? Oh, yeah, that's the Ben question. Yeah. All of our acronyms are technique. So I don't, <laughs> I don't even want to brief the acronym because I think it'll take too, too long to uh, talk about and we kind of waste our time with some techniques. But the bottom line is you want to make sure that you're in an appropriate lateral mode, appropriate vertical mode. You have the correct altitude set in your MCP window. So let's just go back to the earlier example. Let's say I'm flying an RNAV, RMP approach. I want to be in LNAV. I want to be in VNAV path by the final approach fix. And for us, I want to set in touchdown zone elevation prior to crossing the final approach fix so that she actually descends the final approach fix. And if you back that up, even before the final approach fix, you need to make sure that once you are in LNAV and VNAV path, that you set in the final approach fix altitude so that the airplane will descend through the intermediate altitudes. And then once, once the airplane hits the final approach fix, you need to have touchdown zone elevation set in uh, so that she, so that the airplane will descend uh, once hitting the final approach fix. An easy way to remember that is once I am cleared for the approach and I'm established on a published portion of the approach, just set in, and I'm in VNAV path, just set in touchdown zone elevation, round it up to the nearest hundred is what we do. And that'll keep you safe. So um, think clear for the approach, VNAV path, and uh, on a published portion of the approach, just set in touchdown zone elevation and you'll be fine. If you are outside of a published portion of the approach, but you're in VNAV and you've been clear for the approach, you can set in final approach fix altitude. And then once you're on a published segment, you can set in touchdown zone elevation. Question uh, from Thomas uh, Bergman. Within the OPF, how is passenger and cargo weight noted? What value should be placed into the FMS within the perfect for reserves? I seem to always get a fuel insufficient air. I think the second part of the question was what to put in for the reserves. Is that correct? That's what I would read it as, yes. It really, it's dealer's choice. Uh, and meaning it's up to the crew. Uh, we have a minimum value, which is the FAR 45-minute number. So whatever your FAR 45-minute reserve is for your IFR clearance, we put that in uh, to the reserve section as a minimum. That's not required. That's you, It's only for dispatch purposes only. You can land at your alternate with whatever gas you want to. Uh, you can land with one pound. You might have to answer for why you declared emergency, but uh, there's nothing in the reg that says you have to land, you have to land at an alternate uh, with a certain amount of gas. You have to be dispatched. But once you hit TOGA, it's up to you as the, as the crew, captain and the crew. So I put in for the reserves, for me, I let it, I make that number work for me. I let the FMC act as a backup to me. So I'll usually put in the higher of the following two things, either a thousand pounds less than REMF, so a thousand pounds less than what I am expecting to land with, or my, what I want to land on my alternate plus the gas required to get to Malternum. So the higher of those two, that's what I put in for the reserves. So the higher of a thousand pounds less than what I'm planning on landing with, or 
my what I want to land at the alternate plus the amount the gas required to go to the alternate, the higher of those two. Very good. And then the first part of the question was uh, how is passenger and cargo weight noted? In the that's all loaded. Like that? Yeah, that, that's that's all loaded. That that literally just comes to us. We we get a zero fuel weight, and that's about it. I have no idea what the new numbers are. I don't know the difference between passengers and cargo. I, I literally don't even get a printout of, of if I have any cargo or not. I get a printout for dangerous goods, and that's it, if if we have dangerous goods. So I actually have no idea. Sorry about that. Right. Well, that's just somebody else's homework. Yeah, that's load planning. So Thomas also asks, uh, when flying at the major airports, how are visual approaches flown? Is it a hybrid of using navigational aids or more, but in the seat field, such as in a smaller aircraft? Great questions um, so far, by the way. This is a great question as well. This is something we harp on. We fly visual approaches all the time. Uh, I think a, st a statistic came out uh, a year ago or two years ago in one of our annual training that something between 80 to 85% of our approaches are conducted in VMC conditions. So we fly visuals a lot. What we do is and most carriers do this this is not uncommon is you have fly a visual backed up by a published approach so if there's an ILS we will fly the visual backed up by the ILS though I have an RNAV I can still fly a visual just backed up by the RNAV we, we try to back up the visual with the highest automated approach possible and then I go back to the very first question we always fly what we're cleared for. So let's say I briefed the visual backed up by the ILS, but due to whatever reason I was cleared for the ILS, I'm going to fly what I'm cleared for. And that gets a lot of carriers in trouble constantly. Doesn't matter who you are. We have a lot of deviations from flying what you are cleared for by what you think you should be cleared for. So. Where that gets confusing is it could be a severe clear day. You could be in VMC. You could see the airport 50 miles out. The controller could say, turn right heading of X, Y, and Z, maintain X, Y, and Z altitude. You're cleared ILS 3-5 right, but yet the pilots think, well, I'm in VMC. I haven't heard any traffic, so I'm just going to kind of fly this as a visual, and they deviate from their clearance. So always fly what you are cleared for and always match your airplane configuration, meaning the FMAs, to what you are cleared for. I hope that answers. Yeah, and then of course you mentioned that you, you prefer to back that up with, with something so that, you know, just in case you're landing at the wrong airport because you eyeball something a little five miles sooner, you don't want to be there. Correct, and you know, or if you're clear for the visual 15 miles out, you, you know, plenty of pilots have depth perception issues or, or you just want to make sure you're always on a stable approach. So we use the ILS or, or a precision backup or an approach backup to the visual to maintain a stable approach. And of course you can just fly that precision approach because that's within the envelope of a visual. That's exactly what we do. Uh, nine times out of 10, I bet you if Ben was here too, he'd probably say the same thing. I'm st if I'm clear for a visual, I'm still going to call it the ILS. I'm still going to hit the approach. Uh, I'm still going to arm the approach, look for localizer and glide slope in the FMAs. I'll just click everything off and hand fly it, but I'm still going to fly the ILS. Very good. Uh, question from Brian Carey. At what height do you typically disengage the autothrottle and autopilot? Is it at the discretion of the pilot flying? So uh, it's at the discretion of the pilot flying as long as you meet our limitations, which we have limitations that we have to disconnect the autothrottle. On a non-auto land, we have to disconnect the auto throttle by 50 feet. But what I normally do is when I disconnect the autopilot, I disconnect the auto throttle. So at whatever altitude that is, unless it's a really gusty day. If it's very gusty, uh, like I flew in the Mini uh, a month or two ago, and they were uh, landing in the three zeros, and the winds were a 320 at 38 gust 52. Well, I kept the auto throttle on for my own just to back me up and I just disconnected it before 50 feet. But generally speaking, when you disconnect the pilot, the autothrower goes with it. Okay, and from Brian Price, I'm flying a level up Zebo 737 and occasionally the VNAV or LNAV will fail to arm on the ground. 
But after takeoff, or maybe during takeoff even, I can almost always get it to engage. Does this happen in the real world? So I presume this is during the initial preparation and before taxi. Yeah, so just make sure you have your flight director. So real world, uh, that happens usually if you don't have the flight directors on. Both have to be on in the 737, at least real world. I don't know what it is in PMDG. Both have both flight directors have to be on. That's 90% of the time. That's the issue on the ground. And then LNAV, you can arm up LNAV on the ground as long as you meet the LNAV arm criteria, which is a point within a certain amount of degrees and a certain distance from the runway. And then BNAV, you need to have all of the, uh, you basically need to have everything loaded in the FMC. BNAV is kind of funky on the ground, at least. You wouldn't think this, but for BNAV to, to uh, arm on the ground, like I said, everything needs to be populated in the FMC to include cost index, obviously cruise altitude, legs page. It, it needs to get all of the appropriate data so it can calculate the vertical um, information required. So as long as you have those things met, BNAV and LNAV should be armed and it should take on the ground. So there you go, Brian. As long as everything's there, it should work or it's supposed to work. Uh, if it doesn't, then it may well be just a SIM issue in, in the Zebo. Thanks. Yeah, so Mateo, on the same topic, LNAV and VNAV approaches, how do you set the MCP and when do you set the uh, go-around altitude? Okay, so on an RNAV approach, when do you set, uh, when do you change the MCP altitude? Is that the first part? Uh, that is the correct. Yes. Okay. So, like I said earlier, for an RNAV approach, and I just want to make sure it's approach, not arrival. That's approach. Okay. So, on approach, it's what I said earlier. Uh, there's two scenarios. We'll just break it down easy. We'll break it down into two scenarios. First scenario is I'm outside in the published portion of the approach, but I'm cleared for the approach. Then, as long as I have LNAV and VNAV engaged, and I'm clear for the approach, I'll set in the final approach fix altitude because VNAV will honor all altitude constraints between my current altitude and the final approach fix altitude. So that's why you got to verify VNAV is engaged prior to selecting final approach fix altitude. Once I am established on a published segment of the approach and all the other criteria are met, I will set in, so again, published, I'm on a published segment of the approach. I'll set in the touchdown zone elevation rounded up to the nearest 100. So if touchdown zone elevation is 143, I'll go up to 200. So that's the altitudes or flying the RNAV approach. Various techniques on when to set in uh, the go around altitude amongst the different carriers. What we do is when we hit 1,000 feet above airport elevation, we set the go-around altitude there. So we say 1,000 semis approach altitude and we either clear to land or not clear to land. Very good, because certainly you don't want to bust that altitude if you have, have to exercise it. Correct. Now, that's a 737 thing. On the Airbus, they set missed approach altitude if they go around. So there are, our uh, go around call out is harmonized to force them to set the missed approach altitude during the go around. But because the Airbus, the way it works and to harmonize and to make their approach procedures the same on all approaches, they only set their go around altitude if they go around. Now, a semi-related question uh, on a go-around, if, if uh, you're not close to the ground and you get a go-around, you have to be cautious that you don't bust that altitude, even with everything set. What, what, do, what do you do in terms of the mode settings to uh, help you with that? Um, actually, we, we don't. Um, we don't do a soft go-around. So um, every go-around is the same, unless it's wind shear, and then we actually go to max thrust. So we don't, we just brief that, hey, like in LA, LA's got a 2,000 foot go around, if I remember correctly. We just brief that as a foot stomper, and that's just part of the threats, uh, threat forward brief that in the event we go around, go around altitude to 2,000 feet, depending on where it happens, it's going to be pretty quick. So I can go over a normal go around. Yeah, is, is uh, either called by us or by tower, clearly. And then we just say going around, we hit the toga button, 
Flash 15, check thrust, positive rate, gear up, and then set missed approach altitude. So I'll go through those steps again. So going around, we say going around just so we're a shared mental model, everybody's on the same page, and the pilot flying hits the toga button. The auto throttles are still armed. It'll go up to the um, – it, it'll give you thrust – to establish a thousand to two thousand feet a minute climb. If the auto throttles are not engaged, and I say check thrust, then we have to go to the green go around carrots. So going around flaps fifteen. If we're doing a two engine, if it's a single engine, it's flaps one. Positive rate gear up, and then set missed approach altitude. And on the 7.3, we just are verifying that the correct altitude is set. Also, a lot of times uh, in busy airfields, especially if you are cleared for a visual, we'll brief using the ILS missed approach altitude. However, for a visual, there is no missed approach altitude. Technically, you're supposed to go up to traffic pattern altitude. So if you're cleared for the visual and you subsequently go around, you should expect, in fact, the tower has to give you go around instructions. So they could easily change that altitude and also give you a heading. So that's another reason why our go around call outs include set missed approach altitude to again harmonize with the Airbus, but also to verify that we have the correct altitude set in there. Okay, so Thomas, uh, following up on the auto throttle autopilot disconnect question, when disconnecting the auto throttle, is this a cockpit resource management item which the pilot monitoring would take care of? Or can this also be disconnected on the yoke and the pilot flying would disconnect both uh, throttle and, and autopilot? Yeah, turning on and turning off the autopilot is a pilot function thing, at least at our carrier. So uh, in the real world, I've never seen anybody, I'm not saying we don't, but I've never seen anybody reach up to the MCP to turn off the auto throttles. We just click it off via the throttle, the side button on the throttle. Right, you've got easy buttons to, uh, you've got the autopilot disconnect on the yoke and, and the auto throttle is disconnect is quite logically on the on the TQ. Correct, yep. So we just say, hey, you, you usually give somebody a heads, you give your, your, your pilot buddy a heads up, hey, this is me, or hey, I'm turning off the auto throttles, or the autopilot, and, and you assume auto throttles. If you're going to turn off the autopilot and leave on the auto throttles, that would require a, hey, I'm turning off the autopilot, but I'm leaving the auto throttle on. Back me up uh, on making sure it's off before 50 feet if we didn't brief an auto land. Okay, Brian Carey asks, uh, do you find that the 737s in the Sims float more than they do in real life? Additionally, Yes. <laughs> okay. Yeah, landing in the sim, guys. Don't you know? Don't beat yourself up on landings in sims. Um, you know, we, we I guess in the sim world we have to we, we have to use something to judge our our landings. Uh, so we use vertical speed, uh, and even some programs have a G thing, uh, a G meter or a, a G measurement of some sort. But real world, I can't tell you if I've ever looked at the vertical speed for landing. You just you use your peripheral. But sims, we don't have that luxury, so you kind of got to use something. But I can't land in a simulator to save my life uh, on on the on our platform, so don't don't worry too much. Real world, you got a lot of of ambient feedback uh, to assist your landing. Uh, not only you know the feel and your and the, the pants, um, you got your your visual cues, you got the ground rush, plus. On um, the 737, as soon as you pull the power, she's she's going to drop. Uh, if you're ma if you're maintaining V target, as soon as you go to idle, she's going to drop. I mean, unless you got some heinous winds or some heinous uh, wind additive, she's going to drop. Especially with flaps 40, flaps 40, you pull the power, she's going to drop. So um, sh I think the sims definitely float more than the real world. And there was a follow-up to that, uh, I guess, after the landing. How accurate is the ground handling? It's kind of funny you mentioned that. It's actually not too bad on the PMDG. It's, it's, it's actually not too bad. The breakaway thrust required is about the same. I've noticed single-edge characteristics. 
the sim pulls a little bit more if you're doing a single engine taxi. It definitely pulls more than the real world airplane. Uh, I think it's funny that the designers put in a lag in the tiller operations and or in the rudder because I, I mean, when I taxi, there is no lag. That tiller, if I let go of the tiller, she's going to snap immediately. If I level out or if I go to straighten out on the tiller, she straightens out immediately. So the lag in the sim is definitely not realistic, and I don't know why – sim guys put that in there now i only have the 737 as a to, to base the answer off of i don't know how this, the airbus um handles if ben jumps on maybe he can answer that or the 75 but there should be no lag and it should not pull as much as it does in the sims if you're doing a single engine taxi but breakaway thrust speeds that you can get to um if you're real light and you have that a lot of you know, that extra residual thrust that sometimes you can get rolling without adding any power. That happens. That happens way more on the max than it does on the NG. But you know, it's so they're not terrible. You've got a fair amount of uh, uh, VR headset experience uh, flying the PMDG. Maybe you can comment on that in particular for for the landing and takeoffs. Yeah, so I'm a big fan of that. I think that that's extremely value add for kind of reasons we already discussed. The first one is on landing with using all the available resources, if you will. So you got the ambient, you got your uh, peripheral vision, um, the ground rush, you can get a, a better sense of that using the VR goggles. You still don't have that seat of your pants flying, uh, that, that feel from the airplane, what it's doing. I mean, for those of you that have, you know, flown real world and Oros can attest to this too, when you're landing, you know, you, you can feel the, the wind gusts. Sometimes you can feel how the airplanes reacting, uh, to the, the current conditions and, and you can modify your landing based off of that, you know, maybe pull a little harder. Maybe you could feel the wind gust letting up or, or the sink, the sinking feeling. You don't get any of that in the sim. So adding a VR headset kind of helps uh, make up for some of the, uh, the lack of uh, that tactile feel back, uh, feedback, excuse me, if you will. Yeah. Landing is difficult in the sim guys. I, I, I will hold, I will give you guys that. And, Again, from my perspective, I've never looked at a vertical speed, but we got to rate our landing somehow. And, and uh, don't beat yourself up too, too much if you get a, quote, bad vertical speed landing. As long as you do the me mechanics correctly, I think that's the important part. That's what I would preach. And that's what I preach to my students in the sims uh, at the real world airline is in a simulator, we're really teaching you correct mechanics of a landing. The LCAs and being in the real airplane, that's where you get good at landing. But in a sim, just get good at the mechanics. And, and what I would preach to everybody is understanding that the real world 737, when, like I said earlier, when you chop that power, uh, the airplane's going to sink. With those under underwing engines, those underslung engines, uh, when you chop the power, the nose is going to want to drop. So for a normal landing, at least for us, uh, in our manual, what we brief is you get our call out start at 2,500 and then 1,000 and 500. And then we don't get a call out until 50, 40, 30, 20, and 10. So you hear the 50 call, don't do anything. You hear the 40 call, don't do anything. You hear the 30 call. Now I want you to start to arresting your descent rate and shift your, your uh, eyesight, your aim point from your aim point to the end of the runway. And then slowly start bringing the throttles back. And then when you hear 20, just keep it going, kind of assess where you're at. But you're probably still arresting your descent rate. But you want a, a good – you still want to continue towards the runway. And then at 10 feet, I want you to start bringing the throttles all the way back to idle. And then that's when you start finessing the landing itself. Notice I didn't say flare. You're still going to flare, but due to the, the tail strike potential – we really are just kind of finessing the airplane down on the ground. Um, now, the big thing there is we're delaying the landing until 30 feet. Start pulling your power at 30 feet. And then at 10 feet, make sure your throttle's at idle. And then start massaging the, air, the, the landing. As long as you land on speed, which is no less than VREF, or if you have any wind additive, it's REF plus the wind additive. At least that's real-world uh, FOM guidance. Uh, and you, so you land in idle and you land on speed, you're not going to hit the tail. 
you're, you're just not going to hit the tail. Um, if you practice those mechanics in the sim, in the flight sim, uh, you're going to be doing great. Uh, I, I'm not a big fan of looking at my vertical speed, but I guarantee you if you do that, I bet you your vertical speed is going to be less than 500 anyway. Uh, so those are the mechanics that I would be concentrating on. Land in idle, land on speed, and land in the touchdown zone. And I think everything else is is just gravy. Brian Carey has a question about a specific piece of hardware, the new 737 pendulum style yoke for simming. How accurate does it feel? I think Thrustmaster makes it. So it was a question about the Thrustmaster 737 pendulum style yoke. Oh, I don't know. I don't have that. So I, I don't know, Brian. Did you want to just follow up on that? Brian's typing away. Yeah, I use the uh, the Alpha uh, yoke in 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 the sim, and and I find it's it's an enormous improvement from what I had before. It just feels better. I mean, it doesn't feel really real, but because there's no uh, force feedback on it, but it's it's just smooth, and uh, the sim really understands what you're doing and reacts appropriately, unlike some of the older hardware. Yeah, there's a there's a potential that I might be moving to the Airbus. And so I've been flying the uh, FS Labs Airbus and the rudder is extremely sensitive and the, the lag and the tiller is, there's no way that's real world. I'm, I'm pretty sure there's a way to, to change those settings and damper that or dampen that, excuse me, but it seems a little ridiculous to me, at least on the ground. Everything else is beautiful. It's a, it's a fantastic add-on from what I can see. So there may be an A-plane in your future. Yeah, uh, I, I haven't said. I don't want to admit that in public yet. I want to stick to Boeing. <laughs> well, it's it's not a <laughs> sin or anything, not yet. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, I let me go off on a quick little tangent here, just to. Uh, and again, I am not a paid spokesperson for PMDG at all. I, that's just what I use and what I'm very familiar with. They do a fantastic job of replicating real world uh, systems. FMC integration, ACARS to the max extent possible, right? ACARS is very company specific, but you know, if you guys master um, the techniques that are in UVA's FOM, uh, soon there should be another revision coming out to the FOM. If you guys master that and you master flying the airplane in PMDG, you've got the 98% solution to do it real world. Um, a, a lot of the extra stuff is just company specific. Uh, I've jumped seated and it's hilarious. We all, all four carriers fly the 737 differently. I mean, you would think at some, uh, what the, how, how they manipulate the APU, the pneumatics panel, you would think that they were on a completely different airplane than versus what we do. So, you know, I, I know that we want as realistic as possible, but a lot of that is just, you know, the, the extra two or three or 4% differences between what you're doing right now, what Orist and, and Rico has provided UVA, the difference is minor and it's very company specific slash kind of technique specific. So you guys have a leg up and you guys are real close to probably closer than you guys think. Yeah, that's a good thing. Uh, question from Brian Carey. He's asking about the yaw damper, disengaging in the ground during setup. I assume it's because I do something out of order. Do you know what that might be? The only time I know that the yaw damp will disengage on the ground is when you turn off the IRSs. Unless you're moving the alternate flap switch or you're engaging the standby flight control. If you're messing with that flight control panel up in the top left of the overhead, it'll probably click the yaw damper off. But on the ground, if it was on, if it was engaged, it's just clicking off. You're most likely you're doing something with the IRSs. Or it could be just a software glitch, of course, because we do have to put up with that, too. Yeah, I think I'm, I'm reading somebody here. Um, maybe power transfer from APU to engine gens. That shouldn't affect the APU. We go on and off the APU constantly. We go on and off with main gens, ground power, and the APU or the yaw damp hasn't clicked off on me. So, yeah, it could be a glitch, uh, just a software glitch. Well, there's still a little bit of typing, uh, but that's uh, the list of questions. Or here's a non-SIM question from Anthony. Uh, what's your stance on AMTs? They're the best in the business. There you go. <laughs> and thanks for your and thanks for your work, my friend. 
Anthony, I'll say I started my career as a mechanic. Uh, I was in the guard. Uh, I was a crew chief on F-16s. So I, I, uh, my, my heart started as a mechanic. Question from Tim is uh, optimal maximum altitude on FMC based on current weight. So optimum and maximum altitude on an FMC, that's based off of uh, a couple of things. Your current weight, but also projected weight, right? I don't know how, how accurate PMDG is, but I can be on the ground at whatever airport. And if I look at VNAV and I look at what my optimum and max altitude is, that's going to be my optimum and max altitude once I hit cruise. So it's also giving me uh, what it, you know, the, the planned, I should say. So on the ground, it'll tell me what my optimum and maximum will be once I get to altitude. And then, of course, as I reduce weight, it will continue, it will continually update that number throughout the flight. Yeah. And one of the disadvantages to Sim versus real world is we have our performance. Uh, program all of our calculations for us through dis- uh, dispatch hits a button calculates everything so it give us our optimized lateral and vertical profile for the flight and the vertical doesn't always coincide with the cruise page so for example due to winds in the winter it's not uncommon if you're going from east coast to west coast your initial cruise could be at 280 because of the jet stream. Yet, if you look at the FMC cruise page, your optimum could be 360. But we don't want to go up into the jet stream up into that 150 knot headwind. We'd rather just be down at 280 and say, uh, you know, 70 knot headwind. It's still more efficient to be in the 70 knot headwind down low than up at the 150 knot headwind up at uh, altitude. It takes a lot of that guesswork that we have in the sim world, takes it out for us in the real world. From that, with the FMC notes a different optimal altitude, are crews inclined to take that advisory and ask for flight level change? Well, so it, it, that depends. Um, so there's a very good tool with the information that it knows. So if load planning gives dispatch the correct weights, then we go, generally speaking, we go off of the recommendation. However, most often they plan as heavier than we actually are. So we usually lose weight when we get our final weights we usually are our 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 actual is usually lower than our plan which means that i either need to ask dispatch to rerun the numbers to optimize my performance or we do some of that pilot stuff and if i lost two thousand pounds from my plan to my actual i'm lighter and i know that I could probably step climb or I could probably go up to a higher altitude and save some gas. Now, real world, we might think about is it what's the what are the winds aloft? If I do go up to a higher altitude, am I going to incur a uh, headwind penalty? Is it more turbulent up at a higher altitude? So there's a few things to think about, but I'll go against and this is going to sound uh, very generic, but I'll go again if it makes sense. So if I'm lighter than planned and i don't have a huge headwind penalty or no headwind penalty then i'll look at the fmc cruise page and if my optimum is at a higher altitude that makes sense to me because i'm lighter i'll go up and one thing you can do prior to going up obviously is you can go ahead and put in the cruise altitude in your fmc and it'll calculate based off of the altitude you put in there and if i see a savings that also helps me out as well. So a lot of times before we go up in altitude, we will put in the new altitude in our FMC, see what the FMC tells us for fuel savings. And if it's worth it, and if we're getting getting savings out of it, and it's not turbulent up there and not taking a huge penalty, we'll then request the higher altitude. Yeah, I guess that's the one thing. Sometimes you just don't know whether it's turbulent up there. If there's nobody else flying or you haven't heard reports, but I mean, who knows? Mm-hmm. And then, you know, all the, the coffee gets spilt in the back. Right, exactly. And you do not want to upset your flight attendants. Yeah, that's the thing, right? The uh, real world, we're flying with, I mean, uh, there's a bunch of airplanes in the sky, so we get ride reports constantly. In the sim world, you don't really have the ride reports, uh, it's, and it's not simulated accurately, at least I don't think it is. 
Okay, a question from Brian. Uh, it's about uh, when APU flick it on after you land, and that touched in the uh, 737 training video, but you could probably just uh, give a flavor of that. Uh. Yeah, you know, that's it, technique. You, you want to, here's the bottom line, you want to get the APU on before you shut down the motors. Yep, so whatever, however far you need to back that up, or back that off from when you think you're going to shut down the motors, as a technique, what we use is for pulling into the gate, so if I'm, or back that up even further, if I'm pulling into ramp, um, and I can see the gate sign, I'll turn on the APU. Now, you need, for us at least, the APU needs to be operating, not on the buses, but just operating for a minute before you can introduce APU bleeder. So I, at a minimum, need to turn on the APU two minutes before the engines will shut down. Two minutes is for the minute warm up and then the minute it takes to start the APU. So long answer to your question is, for the APU just to be on the buses, turn it on before you shut down the motors, and I can put the APU on the buses anytime the APU is on after landing. We don't, we don't wait to shut down a motor or whatever. We just, as soon as the APU is on, we just put the APU on the buses. Very good. Well, I think that's uh, all the questions that have been posed. We're uh, at uh, 55 minutes after the hour, so coming up on the hour. I want to just thank you for uh, for spending the time and, and uh, fielding the questions from the group. And, and thanks, everyone, for tuning in and, and providing that uh, content. Any uh, closing uh, remarks, uh, Danny? Uh, no, I greatly appreciate everybody putting in the time to ask questions ahead of time. You guys have an amazing, we have an amazing VA uh, and some a great support staff that we all get to benefit from. Uh, and you guys are ahead of the game with the FRAs, with the FOM and the SOPs and whatnot. And then the resources between me and Ben and Orist, and I'm sure I'm missing other people. You've got a great community and a great resource here that you guys should be very proud of. Don't beat yourselves up too much on the landing and on VNAV sometimes because it's uh, those two things are even tricky for real world pilots but I just greatly appreciate everybody's time I'll be around I'm on you can find me on discord most days just uh, give me uh, 24 hours to respond um, and if you have any feedback for me or Orist please don't hesitate to reach out to one of us and uh, we'll try to implement your feedback for next time great Danny yeah I'm, I'm also looking forward to flying uh, with you guys. Um, I was hoping I could fly today, but unfortunately that's not going to work. Uh, I've got some work to do before I go out of town tomorrow for some meetings, but um, I'm going to try to be more active with flying uh, online with you guys, and that'll also help with some of the educational piece. So thanks, everybody. Yeah, thank you, everyone, for, for attending, and we'll see you all a little later. Take care.